Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I decided to bring this video where I'm going to be introducing to you guys one of my favorite libraries in React. This library I actually found out uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, but immediately when I looked at it, I, I took a look at the documentation and I found it pretty cool. So I tried it out and I have been using it ever since. Now, before anyone says anything, this video is not sponsored by this library. I have no affiliation with this library. I actually just found it kind of cool and it's good that I don't have any affiliation in case this library is not well maintained in the future or, or the developers do something to it. I don't want to be responsible for uh, the actions of the library that I have nothing to do with. But I do think it is really cool at the state of which it is right now. Now I'm talking about the React Hooks web library. This is an actual update from the React use library. Uh, you can see it over here, um, which is a library that uh, basically its main purpose is to contain a huge amount of hooks that could be really useful inside of a React library. Now, I know what a lot of people are saying, like, uh, if you're going to deal with hooks, why not just create your own whenever you you reach uh, or reach the necessity for some sort of hook? Well, because um, this library can be really cool in situations where you don't have that much time or you don't want to spend that much time just uh, creating all of the custom hooks that you might want in a project. For example, I always find myself needing to create a debouncer hook or um, some sort of hook that is going to be used to, to fetch data. Or if I'm working with something more UI that requires me to know the, the size of my screen, something like a use screen orientation or a use measure uh, could be really cool, right? But I find it annoying that I have to remake them every single time. And obviously I could just copy and paste from my own previous projects, but I feel like in some situations, it could be cool to just have this library of pre-made hooks available for you, especially because there's a lot of hooks that could be used to solve situations that you're not even aware uh, they exist. So I wanted to introduce this, this library because I know a lot of you guys might not know it yet. So before we get into the video, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it. We're getting back at posting a lot of videos every single week. So I really appreciate it if you guys could leave a like and subscribe, that will really help push my videos to more people. And yeah, that's basically it. Let's get into the video. Okay, everyone. So like I said, this video is about uh, the React Hooks web library. And I want to start out by just talking a little bit about this library. It is, like I said, a hooks library, uh, completely compatible with uh, the newest versions of React. Um, it is a library that is used a good amount, actually. It's not something that is used like uh, not it's not one of the most used libraries in the world, but over 100,000 downloads per week is a pretty good number in NPM. Um, and I do think that uh, it's well maintained. I took a look at the GitHub repository. I took a look at uh, what they're working in. And it seems that some of the changes like were three days ago, uh, some of the changes were a couple months ago, it seems like they, that there is a team behind it. And the main purpose why they migrated this from their previous library was exactly because it was no longer maintainable. So I do believe that this library will be something that will uh, continue existing and I would trust to put this in your project. So one of the main things that I like about this library compared to any other hooks library, which by the way, there's a lot out there and you might know this, is the fact that the documentation is amazing. L like I, if you go through each of these documentations over here, uh, you would see that for each hook, there's like an example, you can see the code they used in that example, there's also references uh, to how to work data types and everything related to each individual hook, and how to import them. There's also a clear detailed explanation of each arguments that it, the hooks can take, and some stuff related to how it works. So it is pretty good the documentation. And also I forgot to mention, but as you can see over here, uh, this is compatible with TypeScript, they, they included types, uh, as said over here, right. Um, so the, the documentation is amazing. And also, the second thing is that it has a lot of hooks, which you might expect the bundle size to be that uh, to be big. But to be honest, I don't think it is that big compared to other libraries out there that might introduce even less features than this one over here. So uh, the amount of hooks that they have is ginormous, as you can see over here, they have for any kind of situations. And I actually selected a couple that I wanted to show you guys how to use uh, that I found really cool. Okay, so the first hook I want to introduce you guys is the use cookie hook, I believe it's use cookie value. The reason why I, why I want to introduce this is because I personally know that especially for beginners, it's kind of hard to deal with cookies uh, in JavaScript in general. And it's nice to have a hook that could facilitate that. And I was recently using, I believe it was react cookies, like I've used for a while react cookie. Uh, and I've, I've showed it in videos. However, 
this library is specifically already has a built in cookie hook. So I wanted to show you guys how to use that one. So you see over here, we have this simple example where we have this input. And what I want is whenever I type anything over here, uh, it will automatically set it into a cookie. Uh, and we can find it in our applications inside of our browser, right? And if I click on this button, it should remove the cookie. Now, how easy is it to implement that using this library? Well, the first thing you would have to do is obviously, uh, I would recommend installing at react hooks uh, uh, slash web. This is the ma main core library. And they have individual imports, uh, if you want to, uh, by just grabbing them like this. But the thing is, with with this specific hook, a couple of the hooks that they have might require you to install an extra library or an extra dependency. That's depending on you if you want to do that. I found the cookie hook kind of cool. So I, I knew that it specifically required an extra dependency, the dependency that you also had to install was JS cookie. So you would go and install JS cookie, just like this. And um, you'll be able to do what I'm doing in this uh, file. So what I want is to be able to create some cookies, right? So how would I do that? Well, with the use cookie value hook, all I do is I just say const equals to use cookie value. Then over here, I set the name for the cookie. In this case, let's pretend like this is a, um, a username, you're just setting a username for your per account right on a website. So I'll give the name of the cookie as username. And then you can even set a time in which uh, it will take for this cookie to expire. So I'm going to say expires in uh, 3,600, uh, which is a usual default value, I think, for a lot of people when they're creating cookies. And this hook will return to us a couple of things. First of all, it will return the value of the cookie through this variable called cookie, then it will re return a function called set and a function called remove. These two functions are obviously by, based on its name used to create and to update and to delete a cookie. So for example, over here, if you want to, whenever we type on this input, to actually set the cookie to the value of the input, all we would have to do is say on change, then just grab the value uh, of the, the cookie by saying event, and just say set event dot target dot value, then you'll see that uh, over here, uh, if we're refreshing, right, there's no cookies over here. But if I type something like Pedro tech, and I refresh this, now we have a cookie with the username as the name, and the value would be Pedro tech. If I delete this, just delete even one of them, you see it constantly updates. Now, if I want to remove the cookie, all I have to do is just add an on click to this and just call the remove function. As simple as that, you'll see that if I click on this, now the cookie was removed. And also, if I want to display the cookie, all I have to do is just display the variable cookie, just like this. And you'll see that if I type Pedro tech, as it's updating over here, it's also uh, up displaying the value of the cookie over here. And it works pretty well. So in my opinion, this is a really cool hook. It's one of them. It's a great example of how simple this library makes ho their, their hooks look like. And if you check out their documentation, you'll see that it might even be better than my explanation right now. That's how good the documentation actually is. Okay, so the second hook that I want to show you guys is the use click outside hook. And this one is actually pretty cool because I found myself in situations where I had to create something either similar or exactly the same as this hook. So imagine we have some sort of website which requires us to detect if we're clicking outside of a specific DOM element. Uh, in this case, let's try to detect if we're clicking outside of this blue square, right? As of right now, this is not happening. We are not detecting it any kind of way. But with the use click outside hook, and by the way, with this one, you don't have to install any extra libraries, uh, like we had to do with the cookie one, actually, the cookie one is the only one that I found that you had to do that. So that's not a, a common occurrence. Um, so with the use click outside, all you have to do is you first have to set a ref uh, to the div that you want to know if you're clicking outside of, right? So I created this div made it blue and made it uh, have a width of 200 and a height of 200. And I've set the ref to be equal to that. And then we're going to use that ref and call the use click outside hook and just pass the ref like this. Then we'll have a callback function, which um, inside of here, we can just write whatever action we want to execute when it is clicked outside. This function, this hook will handle everything for us, uh, all of the logic for detecting if it is clicking inside of this reference or not. So we'll just put over here that we want a window dot alert, actually I'll just say alert, just like this, and say uh, clicked outside. And let's see if that will work. 
uh, obviously it will. We're clicking inside of the, the blue square, nothing's happening, but if I click over here, it detected that I clicked outside. Even if I try to click as close as possible, it was a little bit outside, but here it isn't, right? You can see it literally detects if it is outside. So this is a pretty cool hook. I think it has a lot of use cases, but you guys are the judge of it. I'm just here demonstrating the ones that I found the coolest. Now, this last one is probably the most useful in my opinion, because uh, we've all needed to deal with a debouncer when working in, in projects, because the concept of debouncing allows us to limit the number of times a function or an action is called, which improves not only performance in a website, but also improves the user experience. The most common example of debouncing being used, in my opinion, is whenever you're trying to fire a lot of actions in an input as quickly as possible. You don't want uh, a function that is dealt when you change that input to be fired a bunch of times because maybe a user is typing it so fast that it takes longer to, to, to execute that action than to uh, complete the action that the user is doing. So what I mean by that is imagine you have um, a list, right, or a, a search bar. And this is not the example that I'm talking about right now. This example is actually I'll explain in a bit. So imagine you have a search bar. And whenever you type on the search bar, without even pressing enter or clicking on a, a button, it will automatically search for make an API request to an API and search for something, right? So this is really commonly seen in stuff like uh, Instagram or Netflix, when you're searching for a movie, it will give you it will try to filter out for the options as you type, right? Now imagine if you were searching it really fast, then maybe before the API request is done to search for a movie, you are you're actually typed another letter. So that request uh, is invalid or does doesn't make any sense, right? An example without actually making an API request is with this list over here. What it's doing uh, is basically whenever there's a list of movies, right, a big list of movies, and as I type, it will actually filter out for the movies that uh, the list or the, the search bar is searching for. Now, imagine I get to this point over here, there's a bunch of movies that includes the word the, but no movies include the word the, right? Now, if I'm not using a debouncer, I'll, I can just keep deleting and opening and you see it happens, the search, the filtering happens immediately, right? This is cool when the search is uh, done in, in linear time and just in a small set of data like this one over here. But if you're making an API request, it definitely won't be fast enough to be able to complete before the user types the next character. So you need to add some sort of debouncer that will allow you to limit the number of times you're making that request and wait a little bit before actually making the request. So we'll actually implement that by using this uh, library's version of uh, debouncer. So uh, as of right now, the code is simply like this. I have a list of movies. I have a state called state, which is just for what you're searching for in the movie, and a state called movie list, which is just a list of movie. And whenever the state value changes, so whenever you type on the input, all it's doing is it's just updating the movie list to be a version of itself, but without the movies um, that are not like that doesn't correlate to what you're typing in the search bar. If you're interested in checking this out, I do have videos on search filters in, in React and inputs. I have a video explaining all of this. So if you're interested, go check that out. But the important thing here is that whenever the state is changed, the use effect is called. So immediately when we type a new character, this is done. But we don't want that, right? We want to use a debouncer. So the way we would do this is by actually using this use debounce effect hook and replacing the use effect by that. So I'll say use the bounced effect. So over here, we're actually going to um, have a state as a comma just like this, but also put in some pieces of information. So the first piece of information we want to put is um, the delay that we want to add to our debouncer. So uh, obviously, this will be milliseconds. So this just means that we want to wait a certain amount of time before executing this action again, it's basically running and as a state changes, but with a small interval. So over here, we're going to put a delay of around 200 milliseconds, similar to I think what they did in their documentation. And then finally, we want to put a max wait. So the maximum amount of time that the callback is allowed to be delayed before it is invoked. So I will just follow what they also put in their documentation, which is 500. And uh, let's see how it looks now. So if we do this, now, when I start typing, right, it does take a bit to 
to actually run, but it's not that bad as a, of a user experience. It's actually better because it does seem a little bit delayed, but also it doesn't have that immediate flash of UI change like it was before. The best example is if I type the E a bunch of times, sometimes it doesn't even change, see? Because I'm firing it thick as quick as possible. Obviously, it will change after like 200 milliseconds, but that's expected because I am <laughs> searching for other stuff, right? So this is the use the bouncer effect, and it's a pretty cool hook in my opinion, and I do like the way they implement it. You can check it out uh, in their documentation as well. Now, those were the three hooks that I wanted to ma like manually introduce to you guys, but I want to shout out to a couple ones that I found cool as well. I really like the uh, use media query because it is nice to be able to track CSS media queries without being in CSS. It gives you the actual CSS media queries, but in your actual React code. So if you want to use conditional logic to do something related to that, you can do. Um, so like, imagine you can build a website that contains um, some sort of functionality if it's uh, if the screen is smaller and it doesn't if the screen is bigger, right? That's just one example of a use case that you could do. Also. It is really cool that they have a bunch of like good hooks for performance, as you can see over here. A lot of them could be used for that purpose. And also, there's a lot of hooks that can replace individual data structures. So you, you have the use list, you have the use map, the use queue, the use set. Now, why you might want to use that? Well, because for example, the use list is the most simple example here. When you have a list, there's a bunch of built in functions that you can call from that list. But it would be cool sometimes to just have a hook where uh, you define the list that you want to deal with. And then you just have individual functions, they can just call like if I want to push something to this list, I don't have to grab its name and say dot push, I can just use the push function. If I want to update, I can just do this filter same thing. There's a lot of functions that are built in for that specific list. And they have this not only for lists, but they also have it for sets, queues and a lot more. I think use previous is also really cool. Because as it says, it says it returns the value passed to the hook on the previous render. And uh, this I found myself in a lot of situations needing. So I think it's definitely useful to shout it out, not to mention all of the lifecycle hooks that they also include that if you find yourself uh, wanting to use any of them other than the use the bounced effect, like I showed, uh, you can just come over here and check it out. I'll put a link to this. Uh, documentation in the description. But yeah, this is basically it. I really appreciate you guys sticking around for this video. Like I said, in my post in my community, I'm going to be posting at least twice a week, no exceptions. And this was just a quick video that I wanted to make because I've been using this library. And I just thought, okay, let's, let's just show show this library to the people. Um, if you enjoyed, if you have any opinions, let me know if there's something I actually should know about this library that I don't know, and I didn't mention, let me know in the description. But yeah, that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. And I see you guys next time.